Hello there. This is uh, my one track video for Bride and Prejudice. This is actually the second take. I was about seven minutes in on the previous take and Microsoft in its wisdom decided that would be a perfect time to uh, install an update on my computer. So it shut it down in the middle of my video. Hopefully that won't happen this time. Anyway, what is the meaning of all this? Well, I've been talking a lot about books, in uh, particularly books as material objects in these videos. I will continue to do so. So I thought I would introduce you to some of my books. I've actually got two other bookshelves in this room. Um, and still, I don't have enough space. So, but first, uh, before I talk a little bit more about my books, let me explain sort of what I'm doing here on camera. So a couple terms I could introduce you to if you haven't heard them before. One is mise en scène. That's a French term. It basically means the details in the shot. So the details in this shot are all of my books. And oftentimes in films, the mise en scène reflects on character and also helps with the plot as well. So um, the other film term I can introduce you to is the low angle shot. That's what you're viewing right now. That's why I am looming over you. Oftentimes uh, you will see low angle shots in films uh, it, to give the figure within the frame uh, power, more power over the viewer. So uh, if this was just a regular a shot of me with books behind me, I would look like you know, a typical academic. In, in any documentary, but since it's done this way, it makes me look like a bibliographic superhero. It gives power to me um, and my power over you as the viewer. Uh, but don't worry, in a minute I will make this camera angle go away. So let me talk more about books. Um, so what I mostly want to point out here is book sizes and what that might mean. I have some examples of some books here. So uh, I'm going to introduce you to some of the more common uh, book sizes. So the, the largest book size is folio. I mentioned the folio uh, earlier when I was talking about The Tempest, Shakespeare's 1623 folio. Well, that would be a pretty big book. The next in size would be the quarto. So I have an example right here of quarto. This is uh, American Splendor. Uh, by Harvey Pekar. Uh, we're going to be seeing uh, American Splendor, the film, uh, in this week or next week. Uh, but this is a quarto. Next size would be an octavo. Uh, I should mention that the quarto often is the size for like uh, coffee table books, you know, books that you want to put on your, you, you want to, to show off and that, you know, look good. Uh, this, The Life and Work of Harry Pinter. It's a hardback. This is an octavo. So oftentimes hardbacks will be in an octavo size. The next size after that would be the 12 mo. So oftentimes paperbacks that are of literary merit, like the hours, uh, which again we're going to be seeing. Actually, that's our next film. No, next week on Tuesday. Uh, so this is a uh, a a 12 mo. So again. If you go to a bookstore, literary works are often they're in paper. They will be in a uh, 12 mo size. The most uh, probably the most common size uh, for a paperback anyway is the uh, 16 mo. So if you go to the supermarket and buy yourself a book, uh, this is what uh, it'll be in this size. This is uh, Kurt Vonnegut's The Sirens of Titan, which uh, a lot of Kurt Vonnegut novels have have had film adaptations. This one has not, which is a pity. So if, if any of you are uh, looking for a subject for your treatment paper, uh, this novel by Kurt Vonnegut would be uh, a great uh, subject. So one reason I mention all, all the sizes and stuff, because back in the day, particularly in Jane Austen's time, the size of the book uh, determined the price, and the price uh, usually determined the audience. So it's it, it, it wasn't just... Uh, in terms of books in different sizes, but 
you know, uh, books with different um, socioeconomic uh, tracks, you know, a, a different social groups uh, and social classes would buy different books. Um, okay, and why it's important for my particular collection is uh, very different <laughs> reasons is that uh, a lot of people organize their libraries uh, by author uh, or by date or other reasons. Uh, mine is organized by space. I don't have a lot of space, so I have to uh, make do. That's why I have a book sh books on shelves and books uh, in piles on, on top of a particular row uh, or shelf. And uh, so if you look closely at my collection, you'd see similar size books grouped together so that I can pile other books on top of them. So I still have a lot of space to fill in here, but for instance here, well, you can't see that, but <laughs> I just put some, some books on, on the shelf on top of the row. All right, I will stop here and we will, uh, if I could edit this uh, in a second, you would see me sitting in a chair, but I haven't quite learned to do that yet. So I'm just gonna pull the camera over to my chair. So bear with me. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to recover from your sense of vertigo. And uh, here we are back in my familiar chair. Uh, gotta get my Kindle going because it has my notes. Where did they go? That's not the size I had them in. Uh, <laughs> please forgive me. Um, view, zoom, bigger words, close, reader, voila! Okay. Now we can continue. Uh, one reason why I did all that with the with the books is uh, I, I don't have a lot to say about Jane Austen. And some of the things that I'll be saying are just going to um, sort of build on things I already wrote about uh, in the film essay. Uh, I like Jane Austen. I'm a big fan. I've, I've read most, if not all, of her uh, novels. Uh, I've written and presented papers on Jane Austen, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, that's, that's not why we're here today. All right. Uh, Jane Austen has become... Um, more popular in college classrooms than she used to be, uh, and that's true of all women writers in general. Uh, but Jane Austen, in, in, in almost any uh, uh, 19th century um, a fiction course, certainly, you would have Jane Austen. And as I mentioned in my film essay, um, oftentimes um, Jane Austen is considered a romantic writer uh, because she wrote during that era which is roughly dated from 1789 to 1832. Uh, but in fact, she was not a romantic writer. That was a literary movement. Uh, and there are many writers at that time who were not romantics. Um, but the, the more famous writers of the time were mostly poets. Uh, uh, romanticism is, literary romanticism in Britain is mostly known for its poetry for people like William Blake, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, or uh, um, Percy Bysshe Shelley, William Byron, uh, John Keats, uh, many other writers too. But in, in the past uh, 30 years anyway, a lot of uh, more women writers have entered the, the romantic canon and a lot more fiction writers uh, have entered the romantic canon. Uh, but as, again, as I said in my essay, she's not a romantic. Uh, she's more of a realist writer. A realist in the sense of the uh, writers um, earlier in the 18th century, like Samuel Richardson and uh, Henry Fielding, uh, and they were the ones who really established, well, in, in a sense, invented the novel in English, and it was uh, a realist. They, they tried to reflect reality as, as, as closely as possible in their novels, uh, though Fielding and uh, Richardson did it in very different ways. Uh, Austin also anticipates uh, later realist uh, novels in Britain, uh, social realist novels such as Charles Dickens and George Eliot. So um, 
that's a, a long tradition of realism and, and romanticism is really a, sort of an aberration or a, an interruption of that tradition. Uh, the f four big big qualities that I would say describe romanticism are uh, one, a veneration of nature. You particularly see that in the poetry of William Wordsworth. Uh, there's also an emphasis on, uh, on imagination, the use of the imagination, creativity. Um, and, and just mentioned there's not a lot of nature <laughs> in Austin and there's not a lot of imagination in the sense of um, a veneration of creativity. Also, romanticism is known for its illicit passion and unconventional sexuality. Probably the best example would be Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, who Shelley, who Mary eloped with Shelley when she was 16 years old, and they had a very unconventional um, uh, life of, of romance and sexuality. Uh, the fourth thing would be radical politics. Uh, the uh, the very earliest romantics, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, were uh, very much drawn into uh, and in favor of the French Revolution in its earliest uh, days, but later they became much more conservative, whereas the second generation of romantics like uh, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron were um, also quite radical uh, in their politics, uh, though but not as enthusiastic as Wordsworth and Coleridge were at the beginning of that. So, um, in terms of the politics, Jane Austen seems to be very, very apolitical. She seems to go out of her way to avoid any sort of political discussions in her novel, which in a sense makes her a very political writer in that she is avoiding certain subjects and uh, in and for some readers of her day, that would have been uh, quite clear. And, well, they wouldn't have been going to her novels for political commentary. Uh, they would have been going for the, the stories and, the, and the, um, uh, the romantic entanglements. There is a very prominent uh, British literary critic named Raymond Williams. Uh, and he, he came up with this idea of the knowable community. And in fact, Jane Austen was his his main uh, example of that. And a noble community is is mostly the people that you socialize with. Uh, but but in a sense, there are knowable people and there are unknowable people. And for someone of Jane Austen's class, the the gentry, uh, most of her characters come from that. So that's who she sees. Uh, that's who her characters see. But that's who the reader uh, sees. And in a sense, people who are lower class. Uh, they're relegated to the margins and we don't see them uh, in her novels. So they are not knowable uh, to people of, of Jane Austen's class. Again, later, a little later on in the 19th century, people like George Eliot and Charles Dickens uh, very much um, introduce us to um, uh, marginal characters. So their knowable community is, is much more knowledgeable. Uh, anyway, I, I thought it was a point that, to make. This conception we have of Jane Austen as being romantic, it's, it's, it doesn't come from the books, and it certainly doesn't come from literary uh, critics. Uh, it comes from the TV and film adaptations of, of Jane Austen. Uh, probably the best example, and again I mentioned this in my essays, the, the, the more recent Pride and Prejudice adaptation with uh, Kira Knightley. Uh, there's one scene in particular where you know she's, you know, struggling with her passion, her, her love of um, um, Darcy, <laughs> and we see uh, you know a a very uh, a, a very uh, let's see long distance shot of her on a promontory and the wind is blowing and the music is swelling and all of that. That's that's a scene that would never appear uh, in a Jane Austen novel. That is a very romantic scene. Um, but the important thing to note here is that these film and television adaptations, um, the ones, you know, they, they recreate Austen's story, stories and characters, but not as much her, uh, her voice and the uh, interiority of her characters. And that's largely, it's been done on film and, and on TV, and it's understandable by um, removing 
uh, Jane Austen's voice. So it, you take away Jane Austen's voice and and, and you just leave her stories and characters. Uh, she's going to be a romantic writer, but if you if you keep her voice and her your in psychological uh, insights, uh, it, you're uh, you will no longer <laughs> have a romantic writer. You'll have a realist writer, uh, which is what Austen was. Let me just say a couple things in closing uh, about other um, iterations, other versions of Jane Austen. Uh, like a lot of people, uh, a lot of writers and artists in our in our culture, uh, there's been um, uh, reboots of Jane Austen or uh, you know popular culture reconception um, of of a writer like Jane Austen. So I'm I'm, I'm speaking specifically of. Uh, a book I read uh, a few years ago uh, called Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which is really good uh, in terms of capturing Austin's voice, but in the context of a you know a zombie war and all, all this martial arts stuff, and it's it's really good. And I've been waiting, waiting for a long time for um, the film adaptation to come out. It is in production, and supposedly it is going to come out sometime soon. Uh, so um, can't wait. There was also a, a, a version. Uh, P. D. James is a was a mystery writer uh, who basically uh, sort of channeled Austen, and she wrote an Austen esque uh, mystery called Death Comes to Pemberley, in which Darcy and uh, Lizzie Bennet become amateur detectives and and they solve a crime. Uh, there was a um, an adaptation, a television adaptation of Death Comes to Pemberley for uh, masterpiece mystery on uh, public television, which, which I thought actually was, was pretty good. Um, but again, the, the success of both of these novels and a good source of uh, its humor is that uh, they do mimic the voice of Austen. They don't romanticize her, uh, but they, they do recreate her for our culture. So we're not really in a romantic culture anymore. So we don't romanticize her except on, on television and films. Uh, but in books, we are very we're realist, neo-realist. All right, I'll stop there and try to upload this, upload this, and uh, and I'll do another video. Um, the next one will be, um, of course, Sherlock Holmes.